my impression is we want to take items 11 and 12 together, right? Yeah, we have two separate motions. Right, right, okay. We'll, we'll do it all in one. Okay, so on the, uh, let's have a motion on the uh, resolution approving Second Amendment 2 and Restatement of Confirmation Agreement with Shell Energy North America. Move to adopt Resolution 2012-05. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Did you make a motion? Opposed. Take the move to approve the confirmation agreement for resource adequacy. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed. That matter carries as well. Okay, good job, John. Item 13, resolution approving the Second Amendment to and restatement of security agreement with Shell Energy North America. Sure, I'm happy to address this item, and I think it's, it, it does make sense to consider uh, item 13 and 14 a little bit together since they do refer to each other. Um, but I will, uh, number th item number 13, um, the, the amendment to and restatement of security agreement with Shell Energy North America, this also links back to um, the contract just approved and the security arrangement that we have with Shell um, associated with that contract. Um, there are actually very minimal changes to to this agreement. Um, the, in fact, you know we've used exactly the same form as just being replaced in its entirety with with two key changes. One is um, making reference to the the new loan we would be undertaking with River City Bank in order to um, cover working capital costs associated with bringing on the significant new load um, that will be added in July of this year. And then the, the second component also relates to the new loads just approved and rolling in in July, which is that the, the collateral requirement is going up proportionate to the, to the load. Um, it's going up from $335,000 to $1.2 million, um, with the caveat that the, that $1.2 figure um, will decrease over time as, um, as MEA's balance and its operating account grows. Um, so those are the two key revisions to that document, um, and that will require a resolution. And the next item, which the security agreement refers to, but also, as I mentioned, associated with bringing on this new load, um, is a $3 million loan um, and, the, and promissory note to go along with that loan. Um, in order to cover those work capital costs. So as, as you all know, we are buying energy for our customers and paying for that electricity, but when that goes through the billing process, meter reading and billing, the payment to us um, lags, and there's costs also associated, associated with the ramp up. So that's what, um, there's been extensive modeling done, and you know we're very comfortable with this, this three million figure to cover all of the ramp up costs. And so this is, again, utilizing a bank that we've used, that we currently use for a previous facility, well, for an existing facility, and, um, and the rates are very good. They're very competitive. Um, essentially, we would pay a floating rate during the draw period, so we'd only draw when, when needed, um, and then pay a floating rate up until um, the fixed rate period, which is October 31st, 2012, and then we fix, fix in for a five-year <laughs> five-year period, um, essentially at, at current rates, if you were to fix the loan today, it would be um, a little over 4.6%, and during the floating rate period, it's about 4%. Um, and there is a commitment fee uh, that would be $15,000 and a documentation fee of $250. So this is, again, using the same format that we've used before. Um, you know, six month reserve amount um, for the loan, which is which is customary. Um, so I'm happy to field any questions that folks may have on either the security agreement or the loan. Yes. Uh, similar to the original loan, there is no recourse on individual jurisdictions on the, on the towns or the county, and it's only limited to collections we get from ratepayers, correct? Yes, and actually, so it's it, it's limited to essentially um, essentially our, our operating account and the and the collateral that we provide to 
to them. And so there's a six month collateral. Um, and then, yeah, that's right. exactly correct. And so when you take a look at section, I can provide this section. Um, so section 9.15 of the loan agreement, and this is in all of our agreements, there's a no recourse to um, constituent members of the borrower. Right. Um, so that we make that clear in all of our contracts and our standard form contracts and all of the contracts that we execute with, with partners. Okay. Um, on financial reports, we have to provide the bank with um, quarterly financial reports and then at the end of the fiscal year, my question is where they define fiscal year in section 5.13, they define it as uh, it commences on April and ends on March 31st. Mm -hmm. um, our financial reporting as an organization will, um, will not change, will it? I mean, we're still using... No, that, that, that is our fiscal year. And so, oh, it is. All, okay. yeah, so all of our reporting and, you know, we, we um, you know, are, are, are doing continual reporting under various agreements. And so we use um, an outside accounting firm, Maher Accountancy. Um, I work with them closely to ensure that we have the, the appropriate reporting and that's being delivered um, according to the, the terms of these agreements. Great. So, yeah. Okay. And it, we obviously have audited financials every year. Right. Which, which are posted on our website as well. Thanks. Does anybody else have questions on security agreement or loan agreement? The loan agreement has a guarantee for Correct. Okay, any further questions on either the security agreement or the um, promissory note? I have. Okay. Let me see if I. Oh, wait. I was looking at the. In the. It's just a question I have. In the section 4.122 and 4.123, it talks about. Uh, Funds that are owed by MEA to its customers. Yeah, so that's that's the that's the collateral secured account. So essentially, what we have um, we have the ability to, if, for example, if a customer does not um, pay their bill timely, but they still wish to remain a customer of ours, um, we can request that they put a deposit down with us, in an, and we would put that in an account and keep those funds tracked. So that's what that's talking Correct. about? Correct, yeah. There's and not likely to be very much of that. Hopefully. No, and, and to date we have not, we have not done that. Um, so, so right now it's, it's basically a null point, but essentially those are funds that we'd be holding on behalf of our customers and would need to be returned to them, you know, at the time that they leave our service. So there's no way to secure those amounts. Okay. So the, li the, yeah. the, the liabilities of MEA and then their, that's where you get money that is owed to them. I, I just yes. don't know where you, that would come from. Yes. Okay. Good okay. question. Thanks. Any further questions or discussion on either of these items? Okay, seeing that, I'll ask for a motion first on approval of the security agreement. I'll move for resolution number 2012-06, uh, approving the second amendment to and from the re restatement of security agreement with Shell Energy North America. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed? That matter carries. Okay, then turning to uh, item 14, if I can have a motion. We do move to adopt resolution of the Board of Directors of MEA approving the execution delivery of the credit agreement by and between MEA and uh, River City Bank and the issuance of a note in connection with it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That we got carries the as well. Right here. Second something. Yeah. Okay, great. We're, we're making good progress. Um, item 15 agreement with One Energy for Renewable Energy Credits. before item 15 um, because they uh, one kind of informs the other um, if you're comfortable with that we could take up item 16 first
Yes. So item, item 16 is um, proposed or preliminary uh, MCE rates for the coming fiscal year. The um, MEA's rate setting process um, is done on an annual cycle, uh, typically. So uh, in ja January of each year, we take a look at uh, the current rates and we look at our um, sort of preliminary estimates of the coming fiscal year's budget. Our fiscal year, of course, starts April 1st. Um, and we um, do an analysis of uh, whether any changes are, are warranted in the rates that are maybe associated with the budget. Um, we also look at sort of the competitive landscape in regards to uh, pricing that's um, being charged by PG&E. Um, and, and then we um, consider some of the other rate setting criteria that are really laid out in MEA's implementation plan, which is sort of you know, the, the broad general plan for um, the Marin Clean Energy Program. Uh, so some of these other, these other considerations are um, rate stability, uh, customer understanding, equity, uh, and of course, competitiveness. The, um, as talked about it, or as, as uh, uh, sort of set forth in the implementation plan, I suppose, the uh, policy of MEA is to provide a 60-day review period of the proposed rates um, and really just give the public uh, an ample opportunity to, to comment, participate in the process um, before, uh, before rates are, are adopted by the board. So um, what the you know, cycle would call for final rates to be approved by the board at the April meeting. Um, so this kicks off essentially the 60-day review period. Now it's, it needs to be understood that these are, are preliminary rates because, um, and, and they may change somewhat uh, when the board actually adopts the budget, which would be at the, at the March meeting. Um, but these are our, our best estimate at this time. Um, the other, uh, the other uh, factor that is uh, potentially could, could change the rates um, somewhat are um, obviously a big part of next year's budget will be the power supply associated with the phase 2B expansion. So um, when those, uh, all the, the rates that are contained in, in your packet are based on pricing that we had as, as of last week, uh, so to the extent that prices change before the, um, the confirmation is executed, that, that could have an impact, that would have an impact on the rates as well. So with, with all those caveats, um, let's talk about what, uh, what we're proposing here. So in terms of the, um, there's, there's two really kind of major changes in the next fiscal year that are, are going to impact uh, program rates. And um, the first one is the expansion. And you know, I talked about the, the new pricing that we're, we'll be um, seeing for phase 2B enabling a, a rate reduction. Um, so we're uh, projecting at this point a, um, a rate reduction of about 7 percent, um, uh, mostly as a re result of the expansion, the increased economies of scale uh, associated with the expansion and the lower, lower power supply prices. Um, and then the other kind of macro factor is, uh, and we've talked about this going back to the sort to the, the board offsite in um, in October, uh, is the proposal uh, that uh, PGD made and, and that was approved to flatten their generation rate for the, for residential customer, and to move the price tiering uh, in, onto the onto the um, the non-generation side of the bill, um, and so. Um, as a result of that, and we've been we've been planning for this for quite some time since we first got wind of the proposal. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, make similar changes uh, to the to the MCE residential rate structure and and time those changes so that they happen at the same time as PG&E, so that we minimize the impact on customers. And I'll talk I'll talk a little bit more about specifically what I mean by that. So um, primarily because of this uh, unique and uh, you need for need for coordination as a result of PG&E's uh, rate, rate flattening um, for the residential customer, the, um, the fiscal year rates would be, become effective July 1, as opposed <coughs> to what would typically be the start of the fiscal year, April 1. So it's just a little bit of a unique situation this year. In regards to the, um, the phase 2B expansion, uh, as I mentioned, we're projecting an overall rate decrease of about 7%. Um, and 
in the, the rate structure that uh, MEA has today, there are actually 27 different rate schedules. So there's you know, different customers of, of various types can take service on a different rate schedule that has different pricing in it. You know, the vast majority of customers are on um, the residential, the basic rate, residential rate schedule, which is E1, uh, but we have customers taking service on, on a wide variety. Uh, for rate setting purposes, we combine um, and classify customers into uh, nine different groups um, that you can see on this table. And it's, it's really kind of grouping similar customers in, in terms of similar service and cost of service characteristics for, for um, cost analysis and, and rate allocation purposes. Um, so under the proposal that uh, you, you, the proposed rate structure, uh, even although there's a, an overall rate reduction, um, you can see that the proposal is, is not to uh, apply that uniformly for all the different customer classes, um, but to uh, uh, flow more of that rate reduction to uh, some of the customer classes that you, you can see here. So the, the, on average, the, depending on the type of customer, the rate would change from you know, between 0% to a 12% reduction on average. And the reason that we're making that recommendation um, is really what we did uh, this time around is, is we, we looked at two main factors in, in trying to determine how we should change rates. And one factor was a cost of service analysis. Um, wanted to make sure that the, the prices that are charged are reflective of, of the costs of providing the service. And the other factor was a, a competitive or a comparative analysis that said, you know, we want to be um, you know, competitive with, with what PG&E is charging. So what we found in, in looking at that is some of the rates that we have are both above cost um, and above PG&E, and, and some are not. And so the proposal is for those rates that are both above our cost and above PG&E to reduce those rates more than, more than the others. And so um, that's where you'll see the, the classes where that's the case are uh, the residential class, the large commercial class, or the we call it COM night. COM 19 is the rate, uh, the industrial class, which is COM 20, and the street lighting class. The other, um, the other classes we found to be uh, either uh, at or, or, or near cost and, and competitive with PG&E, and so um, there's no proposed rate change for those classes. And then this table just basically reflects um, that analysis and shows under the proposed rates on average how um, the average rate for each of these classes would compare to the cost of service and to what uh, the PG&E rate. Uh, you can see overall our average rate would be about <coughs> 7.2 cents per kilowatt hour and PG&E's generation <coughs> rate would be about 6.8 cents per kilowatt hour. So there would um, be a, a little bit of a premium on average uh, and that's going to vary depending on the type of customers as you can, you can see from, from this table here. And then, uh, so of course, you know, we're setting MEA rates, and it's reflective of MEA's costs, um, and that's uh, and that's what we charge to the customer. And then PG&E uh, charges for their services, <coughs> their, their delivery services, um, and uh, the you know the customer gets a combined bill, so the customer pays our costs as well as PG&E's charges. Um, so the the there's a difference here between. MEA's rates and the end user's ultimate cost. And part of that difference are the delivery charges, transmission distribution, et cetera. And part of that difference is um, due to a, a surcharge that PG&E applies called the Power Charge Indifference Adjustment. We love acronyms, PCIA. Um, and I think most of you are familiar with that. But it's, it's essentially, it's, it's an exit fee that PG&E applies to a CCA customer's bill um, to make sure that the utilities uh, sort of and, and its customers are um, uh, that costs are not shifted to the remaining customers. So this, this is actually a, a PG&E charge um, that they're able to recover some of their generation costs from our customers. Um, it, the PCIA, it, it varies by customer class. It also varies by vintage. And what that means is Depending on when a customer switches off of PG&E service and onto MCE service, um, depending on the, the calendar year in which that happens, there um, would be a different PCIA that is applicable. 
So it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a complicated um, situation. The other uh, factor which is um, complicated is that the PCIA, uh, we, we um, MEA and, and a number of other um, another no, a number of other parties, you know, we participated in, and approached the CPUC to um, to reduce that PCIA. Uh, we, we felt that the the level of the charge is unfair uh, to customers, and that the methodology was flawed. And, and so uh, we were successful in getting the methodology revised to to be more favorable, which will have the effect of reducing the PCIA relative to what it is now. Uh, and that decision was issued last year by the commission, but we haven't seen the actual numbers that result from that decision yet. Um, and when we do, those new numbers will be applied retroactively to April of last year. Uh, customers will actually be given a, a credit on their bill by PG&E because they essentially they were overcharged for the PCIA. So um, I guess what I'm saying is that the, the PCIA is, is frankly not known at this time. Um, we do expect by the time we roll out in July that we will know what it is. You know, it's a, PC, it's a PG&E charge. Um, it's just going through the regulatory process right now uh, to, you know, to recalculate it based on the new methodology. And we expect, to, um, we expect that PG&E will, will publish that number within the next couple of months, maybe two to three months. Um, so before we roll out, customers will know exactly what that charge is. But as of today, um, all we have are estimates. So, um, you know, just want to point that out because I know, you know, a lot of times we talk about our rate, how it compares to PG&E, and, um, you know, there's also this PCIA factor that people have to account for when they're looking at their total cost. Um, but um, for today, you know, we're, we're really just focusing on setting you know, the, the MEA rate. Okay, so uh, in terms of then the specifics of the rate design, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we're proposing we, we move to a flat residential rate. As a, in, in, uh, right now, we have uh, a five-tiered structure, whereas the customer uses more energy in a month, the price gets successively higher, um, and that is um, something that we that we uh, essentially. Uh, we copied PG&E's rate structure at launch, and, and that's that's the way that their pricing was set, and so that's that's the what um, MEA has had in place since its inception. Now that PG&E is moving to the flat uh, residential generation rate and, and creating uh, the tiering effect through this conservation incentive adjustment, which will be on the on the non-generation side of the bill, um, if if we um, if we continue with the tiered rate, the, our customers would essentially get a double tiering effect, and it would be um, very detrimental, cause pretty large bill increases for, um, for for many of our customers. So, we're proposing to, and th we've talked about this with the ad hoc um, rates committee, and, and you know probably all, most of you have, have heard this discussion in the past. But we're proposing to to move to a flat generation rate um, to avoid that double tiering effect. Uh, it also, you know, it, it really has some. Uh, even though we weren't uh, real big fans of this uh, as it was going through the process, this, this whole rate flattening idea, it does have some benefits for us in regards to rate simplification. Uh, I think people are get, get very confused by the tiers, and uh, to the extent we just have a single number now for the residential customer, I think that'll be helpful. Um, also help us in our, our revenue forecasting. The uh, tiered structure tends to produce some seasonal volatility in our revenues um, that's a little bit hard to predict. So this it has some actually some beneficial effects for us, um, but really the main driver here is, is to uh, uh, try and make sure that the, the customers aren't hit by a double tier that, due to the CIA. Uh, one more thing to uh, point out here on, on the residential rate is uh, the, uh, as, as a consequence of this rate flattening from PG&E, they're also going to be providing the low income care discount. The full amount of the discount will be provided by PG&E on the non-generation side of the bill. Um, which means that MEA no longer needs to have that um, a, a different rate for, the, for uh, the, the discount reflected in its charges. Um, that's just something that uh, uh, PG&E proposed to do as, as they got rid of the tiering on the gen side. Um, they just moved the full discount to the non-generation side. So the, the care customer, the low-income customer, still gets the full amount of the discount. Now it's just all, um, it's all funded through the, essentially the, the distribution rate. Uh, similar, similar situation with we have... Um, uh, 
uh, medical baseline customers. These are customers that f for medical needs, they uh, tend to use uh, more electricity. Maybe they, they have a machine dialysis or what have you that they need to plug in. And they're, they're given a, a larger baseline allowance, um, which is at that cheaper, cheaper rate. Um, that also is going to be entirely um, moved over to the uh, to the non-generation side of the bill. So, um, you know what that means for for our, our rate actually is is um, it's actually uh, sort of positive in, the, in that uh, we won't have to worry about rolling those subsidies into the the non-care rates because that's all going to be taken care of on the non-generation side. Okay, so uh, this table then is a, uh, simply just compares our current, MEA's current uh, residential rate, the, the E1 rate, uh, to the proposed rate. So we'd be moving to a flat rate of about seven and a half cents, again, this is a preliminary. Uh, and then it also compares to um, the current PG&E generation rate. Um, so you can just see the, kind of a little bit more kind of tangible, uh, uh, tangibly what, what we're talking about in regards to the rate flattening. Um, we actually think the, uh, we got some information recently from pg &E that their rate might be moving up in March just a little bit, maybe another uh, tenth of a, of a cent per kilowatt hour. Uh, so the 6.72 is probably going to be something more, more like 6.82. Okay, and then the, um, in terms of the light green product update, we talked a little bit about this earlier, um, but uh, you know, the rates that have been uh, presented here uh, have been, uh, would, would allow us to move to a 50% renewable content for the light green product. Um, and, and this was, has been discussed with the, the rates committee as well, the ad hoc committee. Um, about the desirability of moving, and, and I think that committee and, and staff as well recommends that we do that. Um, it's a it's a relatively um, I think it's it's a very powerful and simple kind of product offering is having a 50 percent and 100 percent product, um, and you know with the uh, some of the renewable procurement on the the rec side that we've been able to um, to accomplish lately. Uh, and in fact, the, the next item on the agenda is a, is a contract that would support this move to a 50% renewable content. Um, we're able to do that even with the, with the, rates, <coughs> the lower rates that we're uh, proposing here. So that's the end of the, the presentation. Certainly happy to take any questions. Yeah, Jamie's going to pick up on that. So if you want to cut over there, that's fine, or we can take questions now. All right, so this is the chart that Damon was referring to. And we're just shifting gears a little bit to something that is um, maybe a little bit more com uh, customer friendly and um, can help assist us all in communicating um, with our customers about the rates, costs, and um, values that are associated with the three different electric products that customers now have available to them in Marin. Um, so what we've got on the front page of this document um, is basically a two different customer cost comparisons for um, an average residential customer in July. So these are estimates based off of what uh, we think our rates are going to be and what PG&E currently thinks their rates are going to be. So um, the first bar chart that you see here um, breaks out all of the three different products that are available. So you've got uh, PG&E's 17% renewable project uh, product, um, our light green 50% renewable product, and our deep green 100% renewable. And you'll see that uh, one of the charges, I'm sorry, one of the bars is um, sort of a turquoise dark green color, and uh, that represents the percentage of renewable energy that's included in each of the different products. And as we move over from PG&E to light green and deep green, of course, that moves up. Um, what you'll also notice moves up a little bit is, is the cost, which is the larger bar. So everything that's in blue on that, uh, those three larger block bars represent PG&E rates. Um, the portions that are in green represent marine clean energy rates. 
And if you kind of take it back, even a step further back and simplify it more, you can, you can kind of break out the costs of or the rates for electricity into two groupings. And therefore the transmission and distribution, which is getting the electricity to the house um, through the lines and wires, and then the, the generation, which is the actual uh, power that you're consuming to keep your lights and your appliances running. So when you become a customer of Marine Clean Energy, PG&E still provides the transmission and distribution at the same rate <coughs> they always did. So you see the first half of those bars, which are in blue, all have the same, the same rate, and that's because PG&E doesn't change the cost of transmission and distribution. Then at the, second, uh, at the top of each of those bars, you'll see a different generation cost for PG&E's uh, product, and then a slightly higher cost for Marine Clean Energy's light green product and uh, the deep green product. And what's interesting really here to note is that even though our, our renewable energy content increases by about 33% for our light green, now that we're going to 50% from PG&E's product, our generation rate is only increasing by about 4%. So there's a slight increase in uh, the cost there, but there's also a major increase in the amount of renewable energy. So you're getting a better value for your money. Um, on the deep green chart on the far right, at the very top, um, you'll see a deep green <coughs> charge for $5.40, and that accounts for the additional penny per kilowatt hour that we charge uh, our customers who want to sign up for deep green. And that's the premium associated with the 100% renewable energy content. Um, so the total costs that are shown below each of those bars, that's the total cost for um, the electricity rates and your, your generation and your transmission and distribution rates that you're paying. And then below that you'll see the premium, and that's basically the difference um, in what the customers will be paying for that 17% renewable, renewable project, excuse me, product from PG&E and um, the 50% renewable and the 100% renewable that we provide. Um, and then I can move on to the next chart unless anyone has questions about this one in particular. Yes. Um, I have a question. On the chart below, it refers to PG&E PCIe charges, which range from $2.70 to eight ten. Right. Are the are those on the uh, placed on the above chart because no. there's no so they're these, not these two are different so the bar chart is really um, it's really showing what the rates are right just the rates for um, your electric generation and your transmission and distribution um, it's it's kind of doing a direct comparison between what marine clean energy charges for our energy product and what PG e charges the table below um, breaks out the total costs of what's associated with choosing each of these different electric products. So John already gave an explanation, you know, of what the PCIA right. is and the power charge, well, the power charge and difference adjustment. And so those charges that are included there are um, basically representing what we estimate will be the cost of the PCIA once the uh, reduction is, a, is applied by the CPUC. So for that calculation, we're assuming that the PCIA is going to run anywhere between um, a half cent and one and a half cent per kilowatt hour. So because it's an estimate on a scale there, I've basically given a range so that it could cost, we're estimating it'll cost somewhere between two and eight dollars a month, approximately, um, for our average residential customer. Again, there are uh, you know, there are variations of that depending on when you're enrolled in marine clean energy, how much electricity you're going to be using, and what the, you know, final decision of that PCIA rate is going to be. So, um, if you go up a little bit higher on that table to the total cost, um, that basically uh, sums up all of the charges that are shown below it. Okay. And again, those are in blue because they're PG&E charges, and you can see, you know, the green charges that are associated with marine clean energy. Directors. Yeah, and I, I just have a suggestion because I, I think it's a little bit confusing because we've got total cost under the bar graph and then you go down here and there's total cost, which sounds exactly the same, but obviously the amounts aren't the same. So two thoughts. Um, 
if on the bar graph the total cost you're talking about is the total rates cost, mm -hmm. then I think you say total rates cost. I think that's and I'd, and then I'd also suggest uh, down on the chart below, instead of having the total cost line be the second line, I'd move it to the bottom because the total cost yeah, line picks up those right. different yeah. those charges, so that way you're clear yeah. you're summing it all up. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You want to cover that other? Uh, okay. Yeah, so let me just, if you don't mind my jumping ahead, and, and the same change I would recommend for the next chart right. we're about to talk about. But if we could we jump ahead uh, to the last page? And I have two questions there. There's, at the ra there's a rate reduction bullet. And it says MC is proposing to reduce rates by about 7%. And if I remember one of the slides that showed what the rate reduction would actually be depending upon the category, the customer category, the rate reduction varied between, I think the seven was for commercial customers, if there was 12% for uh, residential customers, and then in other customer classes, it was actually significantly less. So this isn't really accurate to say MC is proposing to reduce rates by about 7%. I mean, you could say they're proposing, we're proposing to reduce rates overall by 7%, but then I'd do an ask, asterisk and explain that for some, you know, if you're commercial, you're getting 12%, it's even better. Residential, you're getting seven, but if you're in other classes, you're not get, even getting seven. Well, did you read that well, list well, no, of I, rates I differently you're, somehow? You're, Residential Some residential customers will get a rate increase on the basis of MCE rates. Some residential customers will get a rate increase. Well, then I think maybe we should take out the rate reduction line then. Well, right? It's hard to yeah, tell people they're going to, it's hard to give the impression that there's going to be about a 7% rate reduction if some people are getting 0 0.03, some people are getting an increase. And some people are getting something yeah. else. Look, can I raise a question that kind of segues into what you're sure. talking about? Sure. sure. And that is going back to maybe I'll get to this, but going back to this, like Kate was saying, was you have residential <laughs> at a minus twelve percent. When you go to the actual fine print, it shows that the apparently on the residential users, the high tiers are getting a rate reduction, but the low tiers, like tier one and two, are getting a rate increase, at least insofar as the rates we're charging. So then I, I talked to Dawn yesterday, and she said that when you combine this with what PG&E is doing, on the other side of the, I guess, the non-generation the non-generation side, it's really going to end up with the low tier residential paying less than the high tier residential. So I guess there's a couple questions in there. One is, when you say the residential users are getting a 12% reduction, that's only in the rate that we're charging, not having anything to do with the PG&E bill. And that 12% reduction is really the tier three, four, and five. And there's, as far as our T's would be, tiers would be increased on rates one and two, isn't that right? Everything you said is right. Yes. That's right. Yes. So you really can't say there's a 12% reduction because in fact, what's happening is the people who are paying the high tiers, who are paying a lot of money for the electricity, their rates are being reduced mm -hmm. and they're doing right. the percentage on the basis of a dollar of the money income received so when, let's say I'm in tier five, but I'm paying $50, and at the end of this, I'll be paying $30, I'm getting a 20% reduction. The people who are tier one are getting a, with a double, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're going up right. 100%. Right, that's why I think we have a problem saying that we're giving a 7%. Yeah, it's particularly a yeah. problem to tell the residential people right. that they're getting a 12% reduction when in fact only the people like my house are getting a large reduction. Right. And the people. I hear you. So 
it's a semantic thing, but I think no, it's really I beyond it, semantics. It's mm -hmm. actually so misrepresentation. It's <laughs> representation. Yeah. 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 The the other thing, if I could go to this, these charts, mm -hmm. when MEA was first proposed to the tier one people, <laughs> we were told that MEA would. I don't know the exact words, but would attempt or would keep its tier, its light green rates at equal or better than GG. Now, I know it was first instituted that one minute when it was first, that May 1st or whatever it was, that, that was true. In this particular case, we've already built in like a 5% <coughs> increase, a 5% surcharge, 4.5%, 5% surcharge for light green over PGD. So I guess the first question is, are we no longer trying to equal or beat pg and &E? Second, uh, if we didn't go to 50% renewable and we stayed at 27% renewable, would that make us equal to or better than pg and &E? I know you said that people are getting more for their money. I guess it depends on what the goal is. If you're talking about green energy, yeah, I guess they are. If you're talking about money, so, that's a whole bunch of things, but okay. Uh, let me start. Now. I thought you would. You can tag on to that. Yeah, so um, I think what you are referencing <coughs> is um, about two years ago, uh, first night actually, yeah, exactly. just about exactly, I think it was February 5th, 2010. Um, our board was um, faced with considering a, um, a confirmation agreement with Shell to um, to launch service to customers, and really, what we the process that MEA went through leading up to that point was to get a draft contract and get indicative pricing from Shell, and then circle out to all of our member agencies. Um, and again, we were in a position where we didn't know the prices; we weren't able to lock in prices in advance. In order to ensure that we were able to um, launch the program within the um, initial goals of the agency. We, we, were, we looked to see if we were, would be able to get pricing from Shell that would start at or below where PG&E's <coughs> prices were. Yeah, one day. Yeah. On the day that we launched service. And the reason why we, um, why we were looking for that um, point in time is that we knew from before we launched, we knew that we would have no control over PG&E's rates. That's one thing that we can't control. We can control how much we pay for the power that we buy. We can, by doing that, we can control what our rates are going to be. We can control what our expenses are going to be to a, to a, a pretty um, relatively close point. Um, but we cannot control what PG&E's rates are going to be. And so we never set up a policy or um, uh, set up a goal that said our rates would always meet or beat PG&E because that would be an unrealistic goal to set. It would be a, a not possible to keep that sort of goal. So, however, our goal was to not execute our contract with Shell unless we could ensure that the prices allowed us to meet or beat PG&E when we began service. Now, what happened? We were able to do that, but what happened since the point at which we launched service is that. PG&E's rates have gone down three times since we began serving customers, actually four times. Um, and so because, uh, because we locked in our power supply costs, we couldn't just decide a few months later that, oh, well, we're going to lower our power supply costs because we locked those in. Um, it's kind of uh, a scenario where you can't have your cake and eat it too. We can have stability, but stability means our prices aren't likely to spike upward and our prices aren't going to spike downward. What we have seen though since we launched service is we have not needed to increase our rates at all. But PG&E has had um, several rate reductions and so by contrast what you're seeing in these charts is that their rates are now a little bit lower than our rates actually today, and they're a little bit lower um, than our rates are going to be if we go forward with this type of um, rate structure. I guess, I guess at least with some governmental entities, like I know the Mill Valley School Board, they dropped out of MCE in part because of the cost, mm -hmm. and school districts don't have money to waste, as, not as we all do. Uh, 
is the emphasis, I guess I, you know, being new, I guess I need the, the, the policy is the emphasis on keeping the rates low or as low as possible, or is the emphasis on getting as high a light green renewable <coughs> mix as possible? Because it seems to me, and I don't know the numbers, and you guys know the numbers. Hypothetically, if you kept the light green at 27%, I don't know how much you're paying for the extra 23%. If you kept the light green at 27%, maybe you could beat PG&E's rates, but that may not be the policy of the board to 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 get a hot, less green for less green money. So where are what's? I mean, you probably could charge less if you had less if you had dirtier energy. Yeah, we actually have some opportunities that are allowing us to move to 50% without having um, much or uh, very little rate impact. Okay. And so this is something that, this is why we've talked about this with the um, ad hoc rate setting committee, <coughs> really the value of being able to go to a 50% um, product, um, uh, you know, means a lot and really has little to no impact on our rate, um, given the, the products that we're looking at that, that we'd be able to um, use. So um, that's why we're making this recommendation. If, if we stayed at 27%, it still wouldn't allow us to have rates that are you know, dropping uh, below PG&E's rates. So, um, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm about to interrupt you. I just wanted to add one more thing. So uh, you were talking about the tiered rates and how changing our rate to a flat rate you know, it, so, it seems like it would make it more expensive to customers who are generally on the lower tiers and less expensive to customers who are generally on higher tiers. But that, the conservation incentive adjustment that PG&E is adding to their bill basically acts to mitigate that. So yeah, that's, the, what, that's what Dawn said to me. Okay, I, I, I just, just wanted to that. make it clear that the, the conservation incentive adjustment actually has uh, negative prices associated with the lower tiers and then positive prices associated with the higher tiers. So it levels out, you know, the the change in cost associated with adding a flat rate for generation. I just wanted to make sure that that part yeah. was Don't understood. Don't explain that to me yesterday, but insofar as these pages are concerned, I find it difficult to say that to represent to the community that we're reducing residential rates by 12%, because we, we may be doing that to some people, right? but we're not doing it to other people. We may yeah. be reducing to some people greater than 12%. Yeah, and let me let me clarify. I think that um, given that there might be confusion on this point, we may want to just take it out. But let me just <coughs> explain that the the reason why we're saying this is that our if you look at all of our rates and you average them into one number today, and then you look at the rates that we're proposing for the coming fiscal year and average them into one number, there's a 7% differential. That's where we're coming up with that. So, you know, we could insert the word overall, that we're reducing rates overall by about 7%, or we could just take that sentence out. Let, let me ask you, if you, if, I'm sorry I'm taking so long. It's not a chance, Ken, you're hogging the whole show here. Okay. Well, at least I didn't say I was only going to ask one question. No, but I'm going to ask some as soon as you do. Okay. Um, <laughs> If you inc include the PG, the non-generation side, and the generation side with our rates on it, will the customers be incurring a 7% rate decrease? Will any of them? Can you say it then? Because you said the non-generation side of the pg &E bill is going to build in a negative incentive for, for uh, incentive, negative incentive to use a lot of electricity or incentive to use a little electricity. When you, when you add, put the two together, Will that be a 7% rate decrease? Can we say that? It's going to be different for each customer. So that's why the Can we sentence. Say overall 7%? No, just don't misrepresent to the public. Like <coughs> I, mean, I mean, I think, you know, if, if it's more accurate to say overall by 7%, that's better to be more accurate. But I, I guess my concern is if you're putting out a message that there's overall a 7% rate reduction, but if that creates an expectation. And yeah. so there's going to be such different impacts depending on the nature of the customer that I think I'm concerned we're setting ourselves up for people saying, well, I didn't get the 7%, so why would you tell me I was going to get the 7%? Well, so I yourself. think ultimately yeah. it may not be that helpful, even if right. there was a way to write it so that it was a little bit clearer. Yeah. 
um, because of the range, it, it still which, might not. Which be I mean, the, the the rates speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, without characterization. I think there's so everything can blow back. Which exactly right. Back. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Well, exactly. We don't, and we don't, don't even need to yeah. overgeneralize. Basically, right. let's just set out the. I, I like the, the direction we're going, whether it's chart, graph, whatever, where we're laying out the comparative rates. We need to be careful about <coughs> overgeneralizing. Director Ripkind, then Director Allen. I think there are a couple of points just on this 7% thing. I think there's these people called class action attorneys that'd be really interested to <laughs> in get it wrong, so let's just be careful with that. I'm having a problem with, when I look at these rates, as I understand this chart, it's 5 to 10% for light green, and my math is right, and uh, 10 to almost 20% more for deep green. Uh, if you compare to the pg and &E rate, we're rolling out to 90,000 customers or so. People are really price sensitive. And it's going to be, I can tell you in my own household, and I don't write the checks. I just bring the money and someone else is writing the checks, but they're very careful about what's being paid out. And this is, and this is a concern. And if, and if our historic opt-out rate, at least in the first <coughs> round, was what was it, 10 to 20 percent? What was it, is that is that the right range on? Yeah, approximately 20 percent. Approximately 20 percent. Well, our whole business model is hopefully based upon not exceeding a 20 percent opt-out rate on this next big round out. And if we got, this is a price-sensitive environment, and so we have true believers in this room. Everyone here believes in what MEA is all about and the product and all of that. There's a whole bunch of folks that are really, you know, they're automatically in by being a, a, by the CCA and they get a, a price like this. I, I'm, con I'm concerned. And so I realize that we have a, a CNA contract that doesn't allow us like PG&E, like I just heard you say that. But this is a concern to me as a newcomer looking at this and I and correct me if I'm wrong Don when you were making your tour of all the cities and when you came to the Larkspur City Council maybe I'm wrong but I thought I heard what Ken was saying a few minutes ago about well we're going to be competitive with PG&E pricing and, and or words to that effect and, and correct me if you didn't say that exactly but no, right. I'm sure I didn't say that exactly. Um, what, you know, what we focused on in the fall and what we typically focus on when we talk to um, public agencies and, and customer stake stakeholder customer groups is rate stability. And um, the, you know, and that's held true, you know, since we launched service. I think that the concern that you're raising is a good one. <coughs> and luckily, we have some experience and some data to help us predict how customers might react to a pricing differential. Um, we actually, when we did our phase 2A enrollment in August, we, we were enrolling high tier customers that were falling into a, a, a pricing bracket where they're actually seeing impacts that are slightly higher than what's being proposed here. And we ended up seeing a, a significantly lower opt-out rate than we saw when we were enrolling customers at prices that matched PG&E's exactly. Um, and we attributed that difference to the, the well, I, I think when we began enrolling customers for the first time, our phase one customers, there was a very negative media campaign um, going on in Marin County, and that contributed a lot to public perception and, um, and caused a lot of opt-outs. In fact, there was even phone banking happening. Um, by PG&E with, with uh, misinformation, encouraging customers to opt out. And with all of that, we saw about a 20% opt-out rate. This August, with pricing that, that was a bit higher, you know, customers were going from a lower price to a higher price when they became our customer. We've actually seen a lower opt-out rate. And that was important information for us to consider when we were looking at, the, at how the rates might look for us on a going forward basis. Um, I think that it's important to all of us to keep rates as low as we possibly can while still making sure that we are meeting our revenue requirements. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of flexibility to just decide to lower them. Um, but uh, the differential that we're seeing is um, 
some, you know, we do anticipate some customers are going to opt out, and that's fine. You know, that's one of the great things about this program is that there's choice. Um, but we don't anticipate that we're going to see a level of opt out that's going to go uh, beyond our projections. One of the things I, I just wanted to point this out because I just thought of it now in looking at the the residential bar chart comparison here in particular. Um, being a SMUD customer, being a, a, a customer in SMUD's Greenergy program, which is a voluntary program, they offer a 50% and 100% option, not unlike what we're talking about here. Um, the, the, the premium charged by SMUD to participate in their 50% program starts at $3 and moves up from there. So this $4.21 premium is actually pretty darn reasonable and in line with a, a utility that's been operating for over 60 years and is incredibly credit worthy. Um, so in, in light of that, you know, I think our 50% product in this case, at least as proposed, is, is, is very competitive with that in the sense that there's a lot of value being provided and the rate is pretty similar. And on the 100% side, uh, SMUD's voluntary green energy program starts at $6 and moves up from there. And so again, I, I acknowledge that this is a little bit higher, but again, um, we're, we're in different situations. I think over time that gap would close. Um, you know, you mentioned kind of the one day comparison. And what we're looking at here, for all intents and purposes, is a very short term comparison as well, because these rates will inevitably change. And, and I think one of the things that Don pointed out, which is really important to consider, is that we are uh, building in a considerable, considerable amount of stability here as we move forward, which I believe will pay dividends in the long term because we are in a, a trough, in the, at the bottom of a trough in, in terms of natural gas prices and energy prices as a result. So, you know, over time, if, if kind of history plays itself <coughs> out as it, as it has in the, in, you know, in the past, these prices will go up and, uh, and we'll see a convergence. So, uh, you know, I... I guess I'm trying to maybe. What's um, the date of these prices? Is this as of, of when, right now? What's the date of the yeah, prices? I mean, I mean uh -huh. this is a snapshot in time. Yeah. Like, is this now or last July? Yeah. This is, um, we used pricing. Uh, clearly, there are a number of revenue uh, requirements that kind of go into our modeling to, to come up with, a, a, with proposed rates. The biggest chunk of that, of course, is our electricity supply. So the indicative pricing that we've been receiving from Shell has gone into um, the modeling on these rates and the, the, the most recent um, refresh on those that we incorporated into the rate uh, projections is from last week. So there could be a, a slight change when we execute, as John mentioned, um, that could have an impact on these rates. And I think we should emphasize that what's happening tonight is that we're introducing rates these, um, there will be a 60-day public review period before these are um, uh, brought back to the board for approval in April. Um, but these are proposed rates, and the proposed rates are likely to change slightly based on our final pricing from Shell. And also based on um, the board-approved budget process. We'll be approving our next fiscal year's budget at the um, upcoming board meeting in March, and that will also inform what our rates need to be. Director um, First, I want to thank Jamie. I think you did a really good job, in, and I think it's really important to get a message out to the consumers and have something that's really concise to be able to give to them, because I'm already getting a lot of questions, and basically the question is, how much is this going to cost me? I mean, ultimately, that's what people want to know. Um, so I really think that in the end, even after all of this, you know, no matter how much education and how much everything, we're always going to have the people who say, how come I didn't know about this? you know, I threw it away, you know, whatever. Ultimately, when they open up their bill after it rolls out, if it's higher, they're gonna be mad, and if it's lower, they're gonna be thrilled. You know, so I, I think it really needs to be as simple as possible, and I, I think that, you know, if it really got down to some kind of a graph or a bar that said, just an example, you know, <coughs> if your bill is currently $50, this is what it's gonna be if you're in light green, and this is what it's gonna be if you're in deep green. It's $100, you know, something like that. But give them an idea because I think the kilowatt hour and the, you know, so much cents per kilowatt hour. I mean, frankly, right now, I have no freaking idea how many kilowatts I use. You know, so I have to go back and look at my PG&E bill to determine and then do the math and figure it out. 
Um, I know and I, I think I remember hearing that we are going to have a website where people are going to be able, especially with the flat rate of going there and being able to calculate. So it that would be great. Be yeah, it would be great if in this paperwork that was really big, you know, to calculate, you know, to calculate your rates of, of what you have, go visit, you know, websites such and such. And I think that should be really prominent um, for that. But anyway, I think you've done a really good job. It's kind of related to to your questions you brought up. Uh, when the 2B ro uh, rollout occurs in July and 80,000 new customers are introduced to MEA is also the same time that PG&E and of course MEA are eliminating the tiered rates and going with flat rate structure. Do you see a lot of uh, confusion hitting um, the average uh, rate payer when they get their bills? Uh, do you see a major transition time? Yeah, I actually uh, expect to see the opposite because at least for <coughs> our customers, rather than having a five-tiered residential rate, we will have one rate. And that'll be a lot easier to put up on the website. Here is our rate for residential customers. We'll have one rate for each customer class. Um, and that will be much simpler. It will, um, I think, it give customers a sense of transparency when they see that, whereas now, you know, we have to show the five tiers because that's really what our rates are, but it seems like we're trying to hide something, I think, when customers look at that, it's confusing. And so this, um, this one single rate, I think, will really help with transparency. There may be some customers who tend to look closely at their bill from one month to the next that will notice a structural change in the way that charges are being applied, and that may, might cause some confusion. And um, I think both our call center and PG&E's call center will be ramped up for that time period um, right around when the change is happening to respond to those types of questions. Um, but I expect that will mainly come from the folks who really spend a lot of time analyzing their bill and see something that looks a little different. Um, beyond that, there's not going to be a, a really um, big change that, that I think will concern most customers. Thank you. Mr. Dyer. Yes, I'd like to simplify things. I'd like to simplify things a little bit. <coughs> uh, first off, I agree with uh, the idea of uh, converting to a flat rate that, that makes sense, and certainly not to do it until uh, to hold the current rates until July. That would be involved a lot of complication. A very simplistic thing without fancy charts. If you take what was presented of seven and a half cents versus six point nine cents for each of the residential only, and that's what's really important. That's an eight and a half percent increase. And of course, the PCIA is on top of that. Has to be added in. Your staff previously suggested it might be forty percent of the one point nine percent cents it is now. If you take that simple number of 0.76 cents and add it to the seven five, that gives you eight point two six cents, which is approximately twenty percent more than the PG&E rate. What that would opt out. What are you referring to, Gene? The numbers that were put up on the board, they're in there. Look at this chart right here. The chart that shows the rates. What the rate Oh, oh, oh. Table 2. Yeah, table 2, which shows the 7.5 for PCI. Got it. And I'm just making an assumption with respect to what should be added by the PCI. It won't be zero. Uh, you suggested 40% earlier. I use that number and I come up with 20% more. What that would do is opt out. It's up to you to judge. Further questions or discussion? I have a comment. Um, then, John, I'm going to ask you uh, maybe to try to, uh, <coughs> John, to tie everything up in terms of responding to some of the issues we've heard about. The, um, the, com the commercial rates are actually less than PG&E. The small commercial one is 7.2. Proposed MEA is 6.9. Um, 6.6 for commercial six. Um, 
and medium. So all of those are slightly better. And I am, I would like to recommend um, that you take whatever this advantage is. I don't know, you know, whether it makes a heck of a lot of difference. Um, but I would strongly urge you to move that over to residential because I think we're going to have a big pushback from residential. Um, the, um, the chart, I actually would like to recommend a couple of changes just conceptually in the chart. If I'm looking at these three bars, I'm looking at one, you know, this one, this is feels slim and this feels really chunky. And to me, that is bad news. So I don't, I don't have a sense. I mean, I don't know if this is ready to go to the public. I hope it's not going to the public as it is yet because I don't find this psychologically moving me in the right direction. I think this dark green, you can't read it, so it doesn't even matter what it is. It just looks like MEA is, you know, more. Um, I would really urge you to um, take these, you know, the generation portion and make two colors in the generation portion for MEA and maybe two different colors for pg and &E, I don't know. But, um, you know, like a diagonal, I mean, for the amount of, <coughs> of green in it, I, I just think that there's something psychologically that's, that's does not work for me in, in the way this is done. And I also think that it's, um, this is leaving out, this top three bars are leaving out the PCIA, which is an additional charge on our customers, but not on the pg e customers, right? And I think that needs to be in there because that's gonna raise the rate and I mean, it doesn't raise the rate, but it raises the cost. And uh, and if they didn't, you know, if, I don't know how many people are going to be able to compare it, but I I don't think that should be coming as a surprise to people. Um, so I, you know, I don't know, John, how much w it would make a difference if you you know if you took those commercial advantages and moved them over to residential, and whether you think that's you know, too small to be a really significant issue, but anything that could get those residential rates a little bit closer to pg and &E, I would really strongly urge you to do that. Um, I'm, you know, I, you know, I think this is, you know, we're going to have 82,000 people, and that's, you know, that those are, you know, more more residential customers, and I, I, I think we really um, are not. You know, I, I don't, I, I, I don't like this. <laughs> and you know, to me, you know, 50%, you know, green to those 82,000 people. I don't know if it's going to matter much. And you know, we can certainly sell. You know, we can push that, and we can make that excuse, but. I've been arguing to people, I know this is what's happening in San Francisco, and I have strenuously opposed that. Um, you know, I, I also know that the way energy is right now, you know, we might not be paying that much of a penalty for, for doing more renewables. Um, so it, you know, it, it might not make that much difference, but, but boy, if we could get it, if we could get them to be anywhere like, you know, E even with PG&E, just to start with, that would be good. Because as you said, the other thing that I think we need to consider is that these are gonna start, you know, we're at a low point in, in rates and they are gonna go up. <laughs> um, you know, I think PG&E has obviously put a big squeeze on us and I don't think that that's accidental. I think that's absolutely intentional. Um, but the other thing is that there's, you know, this, this is a change. I don't know how much, if you're, a, you know, if you were getting a PG&E bill, um, it, let's say if MEA wasn't rolling out this, this, you know, at the same moment that PG&E is making these changes, 
you were just getting a PG&E bill, I don't know whether those new bills are going to freak people out anyway. And I'm wondering whether there's a, you know, a, a reason to, um, I, I know that there's been an effort to, to change the timing on the PG&E rollout, you know, and maybe, that, maybe that'll happen. But it does concern me. I, you know, I kind of would like it to be, you know, whatever craziness PG&E is going to deal with, and they're going to make these changes, and people are going to have those changes, and then a few months later we we roll out. I would really think that would be better. Um, de you know, depending on how much difference there is between the rates for us, but you know, we'll probably get blamed for whatever happens. Even if it's the PG&E stuff that's bothering people, so. lots to think about. I'm glad there's 60 days to hash this out. Okay. So yeah. Sure. Okay. Then uh, we'll bring it back. I would really um, appreciate perhaps John elucidating a little bit of the history here because I think it's important to point out, especially for the new board members, that. This scenario is not something that MEA just chose to talk about. In fact, uh, less than a year ago, I think we were talking about this very issue that was coming up, and nobody was particularly in favor of a flattened rate structure because it gets rid of conservation incentives and all. I mean, we're talking about flow-based rates, and, and that's actually a fair <coughs> way to go. But there is no question that we are having to respond to a market change brought on by PG&E, this is their latest tactic, and it's called cost shifting. And this is part of that, and so we've been working on it, gosh, for probably a year plus. And I know that our technical team and the Ad Hoc Rates Committee has looked at every model from this way to Tuesday, and I know that the 50% renewable um, portfolio is has to be a product differentiator for us because otherwise, by the way, we're not beating PG&E's rates because of natural gas prices right now. We may over time, as has been stated time and again, so be careful not to get caught in a time in space. And yes, there's going to be blowback, and this is one of these times when you can't blink. I think I said that earlier. There are times when you have to kind of stand tall on this stuff. But if we don't differentiate our product, then what have we really done? And if we can differentiate our product by at least bumping up to the 50% level and do it in a way that is not adding tremendous cost, I think that's something we have to consider because we led with this issue. So I think we need to stand behind this issue, stand up for it, and tell an accurate story. No question about that. No glossing over average numbers, I don't think so. But I really would appreciate it if you could just give a little bit of the background around how I mean, we, we, you all looked at 10 different scenarios before arriving at what seemed to be the most effective, um, cost efficient way to go about this, <coughs> even if you roll it out over differences in time. So would love a little more information on that. Yeah, maybe to, to tee up your. Uh, before we get through, just one more question. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, just on the, in the accurate story department, um, on the, the bullet point, page three, um, first bullet point, first paragraph, it talks about we're providing three times the amount of energy. It's actually almost three times. Three times 17 is 51, not 50. And. It says approximately. Okay. Oh, oh, it does no, it's a flat representation. It's just the, it's a credibility thing because yeah, so much right. of this stuff, our credibility is really on the line. Right. And we make just a, a little slip, and little slips can have big consequences. And that, that too, although small, just 1%, is a misrepresentation, and we shouldn't do that. Okay, so let me tie up our TF5 issues for the team. Um, Okay, so number one, John, if you can address the issue of um, what would be the implications of 
moving some of the savings on the commercial rate to the residential, what kind of, I know you have analyzed that to just discuss that. Number two, 50% renewable product versus 27% uh, renewable, what really is the cost differential? Um, number three, we, and, and this goes to Denise's point, I do think we need an overall rate comparison between MEA and pg e for different maybe benchmarks of, of usage. Number four, Barbara's point, um, where's my chart? We do need to do work on this chart, and, and I think a lot of good suggestions have been made. Um, my understanding is we put the PC, technically the PCIA is separate from the rate. It's a separate charge, so we put it down here as part of total cost. That's a, uh, you know, if uh, there's still some concern about um, whether that's adequate enough, we should talk about that. Number five, I do believe that we need to let the rates speak for themselves. Let's not generalize. Let's not spin at all. I think, you know, let, let consumers make the comparison on the, on the um, uh, facts. So um, I think I've kind of caught the gist of, of this great discussion. But, John, what about the commercial rate? versus, uh, or actually the idea of moving commercial savings to residential. Sure, so and I think uh, we've got a pretty useful table to, to understand uh, what the possibilities are there. Um, in the staff report, it would be table one, uh, which just shows the proposed allocation of revenues to the various customer classes. And so under this proposal, um, residential revenues would be reduced by $5.3 million and overall revenues on a programmatic basis would be reduced by $5.9 million. So already the vast majority of the savings are flowing to the, to the residential class. Um, the only non-residential classes that would be receiving a reduction on average were the, um, the, the large commercial, the industrial, and the street lighting, and if you look at the second to last column, um, you can show what the change in revenues are. It, it's, it's relatively small amounts we're talking about. Combine the reductions going to the non-residential, you're looking at 500, maybe $550,000 a year. So to flow that to the residential is not going to be a very significant um, additional reduction to those customers. Um, it would reduce them somewhat. Uh, but, you know, what we're trying to do is balance a number of different competing objectives, and one of them is our competitiveness with those other classes. Uh, you look at an industrial customer, they're very price sensitive as well, uh, even more so in many cases because energy is a very significant you know, cost of their business. Um, so if we're not, you know, competitive w I I as we can be for that class, we're, we're going to lose those customers. So I think, you know, rate setting is all about balance, right? It's all about you've got certain objectives and, and sometimes they're, they're in conflict with each other. Um, but that's just the nature of the game. So uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of opportunity. I mean, clearly if, if we, um, want, there's always opportunity to shift costs from one class to another, uh, but then we'd be talking about increasing rates for some of the non-residential classes in order to provide a, a larger rate reduction for the residential class. So. You know, again, it's a balancing act. I think this proposal strikes a reasonable balance of all the various objectives that, that we have and the constraints that we have, quite frankly. Um, in regards to, uh, you know, some questions about the cost of moving to the 50%, I think that's, that is, that's a great question. And um, it's, it's really pretty nominal. It's, it's about a one-tenth of a cent per kilowatt hour increase in the rate um, compared to if we just maintain the renewable content at 27%. So if you, if you think of our uh, proposed rate as 7.2, if we didn't make that move, it would be 7.1 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, our view is that it's, it's, uh, for that small additional cost, you get, you get a lot more benefit in terms of product differentiation and, and really, you know, it, this, is, this is part of the mission. Um, we're not, it's not renewable at any cost. It's renewable at competitive cost, as competitive as we can be. And so um, we, we see this as a, as a 
uh, a wise decision and something that I think is a better product and a better value when you combine price and quality of the product than if we didn't make the move. Okay. John, before you leave that point, what would it cost to go to 100% then? Well, we've got that one, that's right? We've got the, the, the deep green, so um, you know, it costs an extra penny per kilowatt hour going to 100% of so our current price. So why is it that you can go 23% for one-tenth and you can't go another 50% yeah. for three-tenths? Yeah. No, I mean, that, that's a good question. I would say the, the, the premium that we charge to the deep green customer is a penny per kilowatt hour. Um, and so that really was based on costs that we were seeing when we launched two years ago. Um, we're now seeing some different products that are available in the market that are a lower cost than that. So, you know, potentially, you know, I think, I th I think the, the, the right answer to your, your original question is, you know, it would be something less than that, that full thing. Um, you know, it, we would, it, I don't know, I'd have to do the math on that, but uh, it, it should be less than a full penny. With, the, with all this rate sensitivity, is there some, I just feel really concerned, I've heard from the public and it just hits my gut, this, this uh, 10 and almost 20% more price for, for our product. Is there some way that we can do a little market analysis? And I heard you, Sean, stand tall, I, I, I heard you. Um, that we could, before we do our big rollout and we have all the customers and we potentially get big blowout, can we get a, a, a better feel of what kind of, of uh, public reaction, particularly with the residential, that we'll get if, if in fact our prices are approximately 10 to 20 percent more for our two products than the PG&E product. Well, I think that our rollout in August to at least um, 2A customers was the best market research we could possibly do because we were actually seeing how customers behave and react in real time, probably even you know, more accurate than doing a, conducting a survey or anything of that nature. Um, so we're, I think that that's pretty reliable information, I, but I think it's also to mention, important to mention that our opt-out assumptions are very conservative. We're anticipating, um, you know, we, we've set our opt-out projections at 20%. So that if we see the number um, go higher than even than what we've seen with this most recent enrollment, we are still in a, a pretty comfortable position if, as far as making sure we haven't over procured. What was the price differential in, in, for the 2A rollout? How much more was our products, uh, just percentage-wise, just roughly? Because you're saying that's a good model. So mm -hmm. was it the same as this, approximately 10 and 20? Yeah, do you want to pick that, John? Do you know? Yeah, the, um, you know, phase 2A, it, we had commercial and we had some residential. For the commercial, um, on a rate-to-rate -rate basis, the, um, there wasn't much of a difference uh, for the residential uh, component of that phase. I'd say that the difference, you know, again, it's a tiering thing, so it varies customer to customer. Um, but I would say on average about 15% difference in, the, in terms of the rate. Yeah. That's right, the PCI. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I, look, the customer just cares about the total <coughs> price. So you're saying we, we held firm, we had a 15% higher uh, product price that a customer was paying, and I'm basically talking residential, and you didn't get a big follow up. Okay, that's what I need to know. There's differences between the, the one, stage one, and stage two. Stage one had extensive amount of uh, negative detraction, uh, an enormous amount of, uh, phase 2A I don't think had any. Uh, you're gonna have people who are willing to pay extra in order for their, to, to obtain their values. People whose values are to have renewable energy are gonna be willing to pay extra. Of course. You're gonna have people who, because of the inertia with the opt-out system, we're just going to stay in, just because it's easier. You may get institutional when you're trying to roll in 80,000 customers or whatever the number is of, of these new, the new cities we have. When you're trying to roll in 80, take 80,000 customers away from pg e you may get both institutional and non-institutional detractors at this, at this point. What I don't want to give those 
institutional and non-institutional detractors is the tools with which to fight us. And among those tools, some of which we can do things about, some of which we can't, one is we're going to cost more. <coughs> and as I'm hearing here, there's no way we can do anything about that, that we're going to cost more. And so we can't really spend a lot of time saying we're lowering our rates because if we're getting into costing more, lowering rates doesn't really make much of a difference. It also bothers me, although there's not really very much we can do about it, is that a detractor may very well say, MEA just doubled the rates on the lowest users of residential electricity. Double. But that's, that's actually not true. Well, it's gone from point, gone from no, 37 but Using your analysis can look at the overall rate. It goes down. Well, the overall rate, including the non-generation PG&E. Well, but that's the whole point. Of okay, but the only thing adjustment. we have. I'm just saying. I just want to make sure you're not misleading. No, I understood from the conversation <laughs> I had yesterday that this is the total amount tier that people doubles. are going to pay. But you're not doing an apples to apples comparison. But what, I, but what they're saying, state. what is, what is MEA going to do to you when you are a member of MEA and do not opt out? What did they do on February second? They doubled the rate, they doubled the MEA rate to tier one and tier two residential users, users or we're proposing it though. That's what we're doing insofar as the rate that we have any control over. I understand the bigger picture may not, may not end up that way, but that's what we would be doing. We would be doubling the tier one, tier two rate, and in a way, insofar as our, our control, we are putting the rate, the, the, the burden of reducing the rates on the large users onto the back of the small users. So I just want to be able to plan so that we take a tool away from the detractors. And how do you prepare for that? Because that's something that could very easily be picked up. And the third thing is uh, you can't use this, you can't use this table one chart. You can't go around telling people that we're reducing the residential rates by 12% because somebody's gonna just pick that apart and you can't look like you're trying to pull a fast one, which we're not, but you can't look like it either. So well, I think we already had that discussion, or I think we're going to not overgeneralize. But I, we may get yeah. more opposition now than we did in the summer. Can I add one thing really quickly? Sure. Just about uh, your comment about the doubling of the tier one and tier two rates. pg and &E is doing the same thing. <clears throat> you, you have to think about the CIA, because even though the rate is changing from five different rates to one rate, when you look at it, yeah, that one rate is higher than what you were charging in tiers one and two and lower than you know, four and five and somewhere around tier three. pg and &E is doing the same thing. So, I mean, if someone's gonna argue, the argument just doesn't really work out when you look at the whole picture because it's not a, we're not going to be doubling the cost for customers who are in those low tiers because of the CIA that goes on to pg and &E side. You know, we wouldn't double the cost for our low tier customers. That's not what we want to do. pg and is not doing that either. But if you don't consider the CIA, I see how it looks like that, but that's not the end result. Right, but you are, but the rates to which we have any control over, the, we, we don't have control of pg and &E's, the non-generation side. The rates over which we have control over from a, from, a, from a population point of view, we are doubling the tier one, two, tier two rates. I, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think you're stuck on the wrong analysis. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's important not to Isn't lose. Is that what lose, this is? John, I mean, sure. It's important something that we don't lose sight of is that our current customers, we don't have many customers that only use tier one <coughs> and tier two. Um, the, frankly, the only customers that fit into that category are the deep green volunteers, um, just because of the, the current phases are the larger residential customers. So in terms of the rate change and the impact on MEA's existing customers, um, you're, it's really not, uh, there just, there just aren't a significant number of customers that are in that, in that category. Now, would we expand in July, we're going to be bringing in those types of customers. But uh, at that point, the, the, you know, the CIA is going to be in place, and so it's going to be a kind of a net no change for those customers um, you know, as a result of our, our flattening, because PG&E will have the same type of structure at that, at that point. So I think it's important. It's, it's not like this rate flattening is going to increase our current customers' bills, um, other than some of the, the smaller customers that are on the, the voluntary deep green 
you know, program. And that would, it would decrease theirs? It, it would, it, yeah, to the extent that they're small users, then their direct charges from MCE, and again, I mean, we're, I think we're talking um, uh, about this from, from, from both sides, depending on, on the, uh, uh, the moment in the, in the meeting here, but, you know, either we only look at our charges, which we can control, uh, and then we don't consider pg and charges, including the PCIA, or, or we look at the whole picture, including transmission distribution and, you know, the total cost to the customer. You know, um, it, and admittedly, it's it's complicated, right? It's complicated, and we're we're doing our best to explain a complicated situation. Um, and so, you know, it's it's just <coughs> we can only control our rate, and um, and I think what the customer cares about is the bottom line cost. I think they care about their total bill, uh, and so figuring out how we communicate in between those two. Let's do no, your challenge. Call, it doesn't seem to me that we can, we don't control our rate. The market controls our rate. Well, I yeah. mean, we, we don't have any control over it. We're buying at market, whatever 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 we, that strike point is. That's what we pay for. Uh, it seems to me that you got you got you got an agency called Marin Clean Energy, and and we got to be clean about our representations and clean about our documents. We got to. was clean to me is full disclosure. Sometimes it's bad news, but tell the jury the bad news and let the other guy tell them. And it's bad. It's yep. that simple. Get it out there. And uh, you can do it in a, in a nice way, you can do it in a soft way, but put it out there. Um, and it's about value. I mean, um, this is grade A beef, essentially, at least the idea. The, the idea of clean energy and clean air over time. You pay a premium for that. It happens to cost more now than it did two years ago. It may cost less in two years. We don't know that. So we can only tell, tell it the way it is now. And I, picking up on whatever. I agree. Here. Director um, I'd like to follow up on a query that Director Collins brought up earlier about deep green. Suppose we eliminated the light green and only went to a deep green product. I'd be curious what that price would be. Because we're talking about roughly a 20% differential. Yeah. We went only with one product, 100% renewable. Would that be 22% higher than PG&E, including the PCA? It might be worth looking at that. Because you, it might be easier to market that. Right. No, I think that's an interesting question. We can certainly, certainly look at that. I think the one time we actually good seats. talked about that. Yeah, that turns back the clock um, quite a ways there. That yeah. was then on the that table. That was an time. objective <laughs> to eventually do that. Charles mentioned that. Yeah. Good point. It might be the way to go. Yeah, one, and one, one of the things that we've seen, and, and we'll talk about this in, in the next agenda item, which was formerly the previous agenda item, but. Um, We've seen a, a, a real fall off in certain renewable energy costs. Um, and, and when I say certain renewable energy costs, I mean renewable energy that is, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily meet California's renewable portfolio standard, but still absolutely supports renewable project development, development within the Western United States. And we've seen a massive fall off in pricing for those products. And that may present an opportunity to do something um, in, a, in a very affordable way um, in line with what you're suggesting. I guess my, my feeling on that is I would be interested to see if it was the only 100% deep green product. But I, I really like the fact that we're going to 50% on the light green. And I think still having a light green and a deep green factors in people who really do have some price sensitivity. They want to have a better product, but they're maybe not as expansive about how far they'll open their wallet. So I think it's nice, personally, having those options for people, particularly in this continuing financial climate that we've got. So. But if the deep green only costs three-tenths of a cent more than light green, well, right now, well, I don't, but well, I mean, no, I'm saying, just looking at the numbers right. here, right? And so, I mean, there's a, it's not a huge amount, but it's, there's still a difference in how much additional you pay for light green and how much additional you pay for it. And that may make a difference. I thought I heard earlier that the difference to go from 20, 27% to 50% was like Well, I'm not working on percent, percentages because right? I'm the one who writes the check in my household. I'm looking at what the dollars are. 
So. Well, and the figure twenty percent was thrown out there. That's. And I don't know where that came grade, from. Right? So. That, right. I mean, it's not light green. No, it's 10% oh, for light green and it's 20% right. for deep green. If you do the far end of the ranges, it's on the chart. And frankly, we don't even know if that's going to be the case because we don't have the PCI. Yeah. 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 So. What do we do now? Yeah, so this was a, a robust discussion. I mean, so what, how do we want to proceed at this point? We know certainly in terms of our materials, we need to go back and revise those based on the discussion. Um, what are what else are you looking uh, from us at this point? Don? Yeah. So feedback on the handout can go to Jamie. Thank you very much for the feedback thus far. We'll also discuss this a little more in our XCOM committee next yeah. month, um, or this month, later this month. Um, and then the recommendation this evening is simply to accept the preliminary rates um, contained here. And then also uh, adopt a 50% renewable energy content for the light green energy product as described above. Um, that recommendation would be um, plugged into a press release that they have drafted up for tomorrow. So I think there has been a discussion about certainly looking at a uh, comparison of the 100, full 100% 100 option, but uh, for the time being, I guess I would fall into the camp of uh, retaining the light green. Fifty percent. I think there is going to be price sensitivity, uh, but I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that. Oh, I do. I think for those three cities, including mine, that took how long <laughs> to get to the yes? Um, if we took away an option, I think you're taking a gun to a head, and you're just going to have people, you know, be screaming that we you know, didn't give them the right information to begin with and then we were trying to sneak this through. I mean, I think, I think doing the education of, if it's a small margin, giving them the education, letting it be their choice. You know, then we may end up being where we want to be, which is to have, you know, as much 100% renewable energy as we can. But taking away an option at this point, no matter what that spread is, I think is, is suicide for the cities that are coming in. Yeah, it sounds like with light green, depending on what the PCI is, it's going to be about 5 to 10%. Is that right? Um, Differential. With this, with these um, bar charts at these rates, and you know, the PCI that we're estimating here would be around 8 to 14%. 8 to 14. For light green. Any further thoughts? Okay. Um, Motion <laughs> to approve the rates. Preliminary rates. Preliminary rates. I'll move to uh, approve the preliminary rates. Yeah. Is that so we're approving the recommendation that it goes out to a public comment, then it comes back to us? Correct. Mm -hmm. I would say, then I would second Mr. Director Green's motion. Okay. Seeing no further discussion, <coughs> all in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed? That matter carries. And then there's the second. Yes, go ahead, Sean. The clarity question that I have is, I know that this is preliminary, but within that approval that you all just made, you approved a minimum threshold of a 50% light green mm -hmm. rate yes, yes, absolutely. So Actually, that very wasn't, if I can interject, that wasn't included in the motion, and so oh, I was going to recommend you do a second yeah. motion. Okay. okay. Then I'll ask. That's the next motion. <laughs> <'Cause> I want <laughs> to understand. <laughs> All right, he would like to make that motion. Move to adopt a 50% <laughs> renewable energy yes. content for light That's green. That's yeah. cool. awesome. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 Okay, now. So now with that, what, what, I, what your board just approved is a minimum of a 50% renewable portfolio for your light green customers. The rates will come back in 60 days or whenever you do that, but that rate structure will be based on a minimum 50% portfolio in your light green. Yeah. So that's right. not a debatable item anymore. Right. Right. So I think that's huge. Just recognize what you guys just did. And again, setting the trend going forward, I hope to God that the rates in 60 days can be closer to the margin with pg and &E, and you all will figure that out. Um, but I think it was also really good that you retained the 50-100 because San Francisco is looking at going into 100% <coughs> clean energy um, contracts and um, we're looking
we're a little worried about what the blowback's going to be on that. So I think we're smart to kind of take a group course, and if we need to get to 100% next year, maybe we can do that. How are, we do, how are we doing on the rate calculator on the website? Um, it's close. Yeah, I mean, it's in flux as we're, you know, we're developing our rates right now and also waiting for, you know, finalized costs for the PCIA, what PG&E projects their rates to be. All right, well, let's make that a priority for sure. Yes. I think it would be really helpful to have a, a I think it would be really helpful to have um, a piece that um, explains, you know, what a PG&E customer is about to go through. Um, so, you know, even a chart like this that would say, here's, here's your, you know, a chart like this or, you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, you're paying $50 now for your whole bill, and next month it will be, you know, when this rate change goes through, it will be X amount. You're paying $100 now, it'll be X amount. Because I think those questions that, that Ken brought up about the, you know, you know w w what are the total amounts, um, that we're going to be seeing, I think those are really important. And then, you know, we we can say the PCIA charge, you know, is you know has been added onto our bill for reasons that aren't clear. But at this point, yeah. um, but you I, know, I my, would just like my to see that reaction particular. is, you know, PG&E is going to be perfectly able to talk for itself. Well, no, uh, I'm just saying that we need to educate people about no, we're here's gonna what's going to happen gonna if you stay with PG&E and, &E, and here's what's going to happen if you come to us because they're, the PG&E customers are going to go through a change as well. You okay, see what well, I'm thank saying? You. That's, I think that's going to matter. All right. We're back to item 15. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, Agreement with One Energy for Renewable Energy Credit. Yeah, I was, was going to say. I, I'm, 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 re I'm, reading, I'm reading your minds right now, so I will try to keep this incredibly brief. Um, and, and I think to, to, to expedite this process, I'll just say right at the, at, at the, the front end here that uh, the agreement that we're looking at here is, is uh, to purchase renewable energy certificates. These are Greeny Energy Certified Renewable Energy Certificates uh, delivered over a two-year period. The quantities uh, con considered here in the contract would be 50,000 renewable energy certificates a year for the two-year period, so 100,000 in total. Uh, your board in November, I believe, of, of last year, approved an agreement in virtually identical form to the one that's before you tonight uh, for another separate <coughs> renewable energy certificate transaction of a smaller volume. And, uh, and really what the purpose of this agreement is, is, is to, port, to support the very recently approved uh, decision to move forward with a 50% uh, light green renewable energy content. And uh, this particular agreement here would support a considerable portion of the renewable energy need to meet that 50% requirement. Uh, I think it's important to note that this agreement was, uh, this actual, this opportunity was brought to us by Evolution Markets. This is a, a marketer slash broker of renewable energy and environmental products that we're very familiar with. Uh, they, are, they are one of the leading brokers of these types of products, and they are the entity that, that brought us our uh, agreement with G2 Energy for uh, landfill gas to energy renew uh, landfill gas to energy that we'll begin delivering in the not too distant uh, future here. So, in any case, uh, a, a very credible entity brought this to our attention. Uh, the the prospective counterparty here is also a very credible entity. The the One Energy organization um, 
is, is a marketer of, of renewable energy certificates, also a project developer. They work directly with landowners and their development uh, partners in order to move renewable energy uh, projects through the pipeline, if you will. One of the resources that is uh, going to be participating in this particular transaction is the PA2 uh, wind farm that's located in Wasco, or Wasco County, Oregon, which is basically on the Oregon-Washington border. Um, this uh, has a nine megawatt capacity, this particular wind farm can produce up to about 27,000 renewable energy certificates or megawatt hours a year. Um, we, are, we, we basically have a firm commitment for 5,000, uh, a minimum of 5,000 of those 27,000 um, renewable energy certificates produced by that particular facility. The balance of the volumes will be met by other wind facilities located within the Western Interconnection. Uh, there's a lot of verbiage in this staff report, and, and, and some of it underscores the uh, potential to use these renewable energy certificates not only to support our move to a 50% light green threshold, as well as additional deep green customers, but also for compliance purposes. Um, right now, we're still waiting for the regula regulators to elaborate on uh, the extent to which we may be able to do that. Right now, that's a little bit in flux. But if it happens to be the case that we could use these renewable energy certificates for, for compliance purposes, it would add uh, tremendous value to this particular transaction. So that's just something that I don't want to draw too much attention to it because that, that is, is really a possibility at this point and it hasn't been decided upon. But, uh, but that would be an additional benefit uh, if, if that decision were to be made. So I think that really hits all the high points. Clearly, uh, transactions like this support the environmental objectives of this particular agency, uh, not only the renewable energy objectives, but the overall environmental objectives, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And, uh, and, and the price point here is incredibly competitive. While the prices are redacted in the agreement that's in front of you this evening, um, I can assure you that this is uh, the, the lowest point at which we will uh, have transacted for renewable energy certificates. Uh, so that's also very positive. Um, I think that's about it. I, I hope, hopefully that was short enough. I'm happy to answer <laughs> questions. <laughs> this is for 100,000 recs? Yes, that's correct. And can you tell us, I realize price is probably confidential or you can't put a finger on it, but could you give us a range or approximate cost? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can tell you. Again. If, yeah, I mean, one, one comment that I think might might be good to start with is that the last direct transaction that we approved um, came in at three dollars and fifty cents um, per rack. Per rack. Um, and as Kirby stated, this transaction would be coming in below that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. On a better, better number. <clears throat> And, and I know we've already had the crash course, but I think everybody kind of understands now that renewable energy certificates are, are you know, when renewable energy is produced, you have the electric energy and the environmental benefits, and the environmental benefits are captured through the issuance of a REC, and that's what we're, we're buying here. Um, it's really a very efficient way to, uh, to match up interested buyers of these environmental attributes while allowing for the, all the operational considerations to be dealt with on the most efficient basis possible, which is delivering the energy locally, um, as opposed to transporting it over a, over a long distance. So, just, just out of curiosity, yeah. what is the renewable rate of the energy that we get from uh, Shell? Uh, yeah, for the uh, for the phase one transaction, it, it, it is. Uh, Ten dollars and fifty cents. No, no, no. What is the percentage of renewable? Oh, the percentage of renewable. Uh, well, that's it's, it's guaranteed at twenty-seven percent. That so we're buying twenty-seven percent without any recs at all. Correct. Yeah. Uh, she oh, says it's well. It, she says it's it, it's it's well. Yeah, there there are the, the twenty-seven percent that we're we're getting is there there are well the recs are actually the, the deep green recs are, are additive to that because what we have <coughs> are the category one and the, and the category two so they're we're really not getting any recs anymore yeah so yeah so the answer is 27. 
Yeah, it's it, it's without RECs, it's 27. Yeah. yeah. Without unbundled RECs, I mean, you get a REC, that's your title to the renewable. The question is, are you talking about a REC bundled with energy, or are you talking about a REC on its own? Let's talk about a bundle with energy. Is that the 27? Yeah, that's the 27 percent. Okay, any further discussion? Members of the public on this item? Okay, I'll ask for a motion on the uh, to approve the agreement with One Energy for Renewable Energy Credit. I'll make that motion. God, you got to be fast. Do I have a second? I, I'd be second, but I didn't make the motion to approve renewable energy certificates. You know. I'm to tie you down. Yeah. Okay. Second. Great. Um, all, all in favor? Aye. Yeah. Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. okay, moving to item 17, Energy Upgrade California Rebate Program. Yeah, I'll take the lead on this one. Um, this should be, this is, this, um, staff report is Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Mr. 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 about the energy efficiency rebate that we are currently providing to our customers. Um, in relationship to the Energy Upgrade California program. I think most of you all are familiar with this rebate program by now, but just as a refresher, uh, the board approved a $10,000 budget allocation uh, to provide these rebates back in 2010, late 2010, and um, there's a couple of steps that uh, customers need to go, to go through in order to um, obtain our rebate. Um, and they are all in relation to participating in the Energy Upgrade California program. So um, Energy Upgrade California basically helps homeowners um, to assess their homes and implement measures that will increase their energy efficiency. So the first step that needs to be taken is um, that the homeowner will uh, contact a home energy rater or a certified contractor to do um, an energy assessment of their home. And the assessment determines how much energy is being used in the home and also identifies measures to help reduce that um, energy use. So uh, customers have to pay for that audit. And um, you know, once they have that audit done, it's up to them to decide if they want to move forward and implement, implement the recommended measures to uh, reduce their energy use. There have been rebates along the way for customers to utilize in order to help offset the cost of the audit or the energy assessment. Um, it tends to be around about $500. Um, previously, the County of Marin and the Association of Bay Area Governments were providing rebates uh, to uh, people who were participating in this program and who were getting the audits. So the rebate was uh, provided for the assessment, for the total cost of the assessment, up to $600. Um, the funds that the County of Marin was using and that ABAG was using to um, help offset the cost of those audits have de been depleted. Um, they were fully committed in early January of this year, and so um, currently there, there isn't any uh, funding for our customers to use to help offset the audit that they would need to, ha to have done if they want to move forward with this program. Um, the reason that customers would really want to move forward with it is because there are several other rebates that are available once you actually decide to implement the measures that reduce your energy usage. Uh, there's rebates from PG&E, and our rebate right now is currently available to customers who actually implement the measures and achieve a minimum um, energy reduction of at least 15%. Um, we discussed this at the technical committee meeting in January, and uh, the technical committee made a recommendation that we expand the use of our EE rebate to basically allow customers to use the rebate either to offset the cost of their energy assessment or to offset the cost of um, implementing the recommended measures to reduce their energy use. Um, if, if your board did decide to move forward and expand um, the use of this rebate, customers would only be able to use the rebate for one of those things. They wouldn't be able to use our rebate for both the, ass the assessment and the implementation. It would be either or. Um, our customers also wouldn't be eligible to use that rebate for the assessment if they have, had already um, ob obtained a rebate from the County of Marin or ABAG or another entity to offset um, the assessment cost. So uh, attached to this uh, staff report, 
is the uh, application process, which basically defines the steps that customers need to go through to get our rebate, as well as the request for payment form. And these two attached documents have been updated basically to clarify, um, you know, the rules that would be changed if your board made this approval. Um, it wouldn't require any additional funding to make this change um, because um, the funds were already allotted by the board. And so what we're asking for you to do tonight is basically to approve um, this change to allow our customers to use it either for the assessment or for the implementation of the measures to reduce the energy usage. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Two questions? Yes. You, there was an allocation of $10,000, which sounds like it's 20 people. How much of that has been used? Yeah, um, one thing that is just a reminder, um, in January, uh, your board approved uh, to use those funds, the 10,000 funds, not only for the energy efficiency rebate of $500, but also for the solar rebate of $500. Uh, right now, we have uh, five rebates that are going to be provided to customers, three for the solar rebate and two for the energy efficiency rebate. So we've got um, enough money left right now for 15 more rebates. And where do we, for this expanded program, where would you get the money? It would come from the same pot of, of funds. So basically, um, it's not really expanding the program, it's just allowing the customer to have more flexibility uh, towards you know, what they use the rebate for. So we wouldn't need any additional funding. Okay. So you have $7,500 worth. Right. All right. Uh, Seeing no further uh, questions, do I have a motion on this item? <coughs> you to approve Sorry. the use of MEA energy efficiency rebates for completion of either home energy assessment or home energy upgrades as outlined in MECE's application process request. Moved by Director Collins. Second. Second by Director Athos. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. That matter, Tara. How do we sign up for this? <laughs> It tells you if you make the application. I mean, it's right here. Huh? <laughs> Truly what we've all been waiting for. <laughs> Item 9. I know that it's always the safe, save the best for last. I didn't think that I would make page 3 um, ever on an agenda, but here I am. Uh, I actually wasn't going to do a presentation today, but by actually, literally by popular request. Here, here I am. The the top three items. So, <laughs> but I'm, I'm only going to touch on two proceedings today. Um, just two items that have been coming up. And I would like to mention that um, there's going to be a more in-depth discussion about regulatory matters at the upcoming technical committee on the 21st. And so I know it's riveting to everybody. I hope everybody um, comes and participates in the discussion because it really is, um, regulatory affairs is really a core function of what we do and um, you know, to ensure that there is an even playing field um, for CCAs and for us to, um, to really exist and thrive and for other CCAs to, to follow in our footsteps. So um, the, the two items that I'm going to talk to talk about today, the first one relates to smart grid data and privacy. Um, as you all know, smart meters have been um, being deployed across the service territories of PG&E, Southern California Edison, and SDG&E. And so um, this is resulting in a, in a huge increase in the quantity and quality of data, just the, the sheer amount of information provided. Um, by the smart meters is, is very significant. And so what the commission is addressing here is um, really two factors. One is how do you protect this data? And the second is uh, how do you make it accessible to customers? And so um, I've actually put up the, the public utilities code section um, that, that's sort of the basis for, for this discussion at the commission. Um, currently, you know, we, there was recently a first phase <clears throat> of discussing this question, and it applied um, extensive rules um, regarding both of those components, protection and availability of information to the, the, the electrical corporations, so PG&E, SDG, and SCE. Um, 
And the, the commission posed the question of, well, what rules should be applicable to CCAs? Um, but the, the core function to remember here is that the, the commission has limited jurisdiction over CCAs. And there's a couple of you know, ways that the commission <coughs> does have jurisdiction. One relates to um, legislation that is applicable to all load serving entities. So when you're thinking about the, the RPS or you're thinking about um, resource adequacy or GHG emission performance standards, the commission sort of sets how those rules run. And so everybody who's load serving entity abides by those rules. And there's other rules that are applicable to the interaction between CCAs and the IOU as a regulated entity. Um, but here the legislation only refers to electrical corporations, which is the investor owned utilities. Um, so what are essentially our responses to this is that we have various rules that apply to us, but they're not under the jurisdiction of the Public Utilities Commission. Um, so when you're thinking about this, it's we have the California Public Records Act, which does in some cases require disclosure of information, but when you're talking about customer data, that's an entirely different category, which requir requires protection of that data. Uh, furthermore, we have a non-disclosure agreement with PG&E, and also, you know, we have our own privacy rules that have been promulgated by your board in 2010 before we were even serving customers. So I think that, you know, why this proceeding matters is a matter of jurisdiction, and it's it's the ability of you know, ensuring that we are developing our own policies and respecting our own customers' data um, while continuing to inform the commission of our relationship to that data. For example, um, certain accessibility rules don't really make sense in the case of CCAs because we're not in control of the meter. We don't, we don't control the data. We are, um, our receipt of the data is incumbent upon the investor and utility providing it to us. Um, and so this is really m more of a, of a distribution function. Um, so it's just a matter of clarifying this with the commission and ensuring that these, that the, the jurisdictional bounds <coughs> of the commission are not overstepped, um, even if it, they have good intentions to do so. Um, and so, but I think that one of the, one of the wonderful things that's actually coming out of this proceeding generally and the first phase of this proceeding is, um, the commission was really looking towards best, best practices of of privacy and so I think that you know this is you know continuing to inform how we look at our own privacy policies and how we can change those and tailor those in the future so that's that's the first proceeding that, I, that I'll just touch on and then the second proceeding relates to an application that was submitted by PG&E and this is for a smart grid pilot pilot deployment um, what pg e has requested is um, over $100 million worth of funds. Um, and th these funds would go towards projects that would improve um, demand forecasts for pg es bundled customers. It would pay for certain pg e marketing. And there's other smart grid components. Um, and the benefits of which actually uh, accrue, the preponderance of them accrue to pg e rate pairs, um, so avoided energy procurement costs, actually, the benefit would be between 550 million and 1.1 billion to <coughs> PG&E's bundled customers, so those receiving generation service from PG&E. Um, and the other benefits are actually negligible um, in comparison with, with those, those costs. But the question is, well, in PG&E's application, who did they recommend pay for these programs? Well, they recommended that these programs be paid for through the, the DRAM, the distribution rate allocation mechanism. So essentially our customers would pay for benefits accruing directly to PG&E customers. And this is, this is very clearly laid out in their application and the testimony that went along with it. So what is the status of this? And <coughs> you know, our concern here obviously is a matter of, of cost shifting um, and this is this is actually a particularly disconcerting application because um, we protested the application on these cost ca causation grounds. And um, pg e has actually requested that the commission summarily reject uh, our cost allocation arguments. So this is, this is a div divergence from past precedent where pg e has sort of 
fought the fight and argued that things should be put into distribution. But here, essentially, they're saying, well, we don't want to fight the fight. Just trust us. It deserves to be in distribution. And this is, this is concerning. So it's, it's a much more aggressive approach. Um, and it just demonstrates you know, how critical it is to um, have the level of involvement and even greater involvement than we have um, at the commission in order to really uh, fight back against these types of um, concerns. So I think that you know, just as an overview, that these two, um, these two proceedings really touch on you know, one sort of touches on the jurisdictional concerns and another one touches on these cost allocation concerns. Um, and, you know, those are the two core themes, which, you know, I feel like a little bit like a broken record each time I come back, but they're, they're really um, core um, concerns going forward. And so, you know, we look forward to um, hopefully having our, our voice heard um, <coughs> and getting a response from the commission on this. Does anybody have any questions on this? Yeah, uh, there there would be. So I think that you know what we had asked for is actually um, just that part of the scope of the proceeding look at cost allocation. Okay. Now there's certain, for example, okay. So as I mentioned, the energy procurement costs, um, the estimate was uh, 550 million to 1.1 billion in benefit. There is something called avoided O and M costs, which actually lacks specificity as to whether it was generation or T and D, um, and that benefit would be 80 million to 100 million, so um, a significant scale smaller, you know, 10 percent of this generation benefit. Um, there is they claim an improvement in system reliability of five to nine percent, um, but that hasn't been that benefit hasn't really been quantified in. Uh, dollar terms and then when you're thinking about um, an, an additional item that they claim as a benefit here is a is a, a GHG benefit of uh, 1.6 to 2.2 million metric tons of CO2 um, but you know the interesting component about this is you know we are required to comply with our own uh, GHG thresholds um, and GHG free content and so to allocate distribution costs in order to <coughs> provide a greater GHG benefit to uh, pg and &E generation customers. It, it just doesn't totally line up. So should the allocation be, you know, 100% in generation? I think it's, it's to be determined. You have to take a look at the facts, look at the evidence, um, go through discovery hearings, um, et cetera. But based on just the preponderance of the benefit that's accruing these costs, it does not seem appropriate to uh, allocate them the way that they're allocated 100% to distribution. Okay, thanks, Beth. And you have your written report in yeah. the packet as well. Yeah. So with more items. And there's, it, was, it, was a, it was a light month in January, but there's a lot more coming in February. So <laughs> keep a weather eye. There you go. Okay, item 20, board and staff matters. All right, well, thank you again, everyone, for and staff and board members for sitting through this. Uh, fueled by cake. Uh, uh, so we're adjourned.